I'm Kate Manahan. Thank you for joining me for the 218th edition of New Mainers Speak. This is a bi-weekly half-hour program where you can hear firsthand about the lives of some of Maine's immigrants. During the show, we visit with individuals regarding their life stories and enduring hopes as New Mainers. Today, my guest is Hore Haddadi, a Kurdish-Iranian-American from Wyndham, Maine. Born to Iranian parents who fled to Iraq, he arrived in the U.S. as a baby. He attended Wyndham High School and in 2016 graduated from USM with a bachelor's degree in poli science. And then, though he's only 24 years old, he's already completed a master's degree from Suffolk University in political science and policy. Last year, he published a book called Finding Kurdistan, a Kurdish Iranian American's Journey Home and is here today to talk about his life as a Kurdish person, an author, and a young Mainer. Welcome to New Mainer Speak Hurrah. It's good to be here. Thanks so much. My pleasure. We had a fun visit in a coffee shop earlier this week, and he handed me a copy of his book, which <laughs> I enjoyed reading immensely. And so much of this interview will be based on that. So for most of your life, you have had to give that regular elevator speech about uh, what being a Kurd is what that means. Let me help you out a bit here. Kurds are established ethnic group of people from a region now contained in parts of Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. You mentioned to me that Kurds are the largest ethnic group in the world to not have their own country. So here's your chance to let people know what you wish everyone understood about what it means to be Kurdish. Yeah, you know, I think it's very important that we have this conversation about the, the Kurdish community uh, Kurdistan and what it is we are uh, fighting for. Um, as I mentioned, we are the largest ethnic group in the world without a homeland of their own. Um, but we are uh, a nation of maybe 40 million people um, who are fighting for democracy, equality, and uh, freedom and self determination. Um, and I think that's very important. Self determination is such a big notion in this country. Um, and we can just look back to the 1700s where we told. Uh, the British Empire that we want to uh, dictate our own future and, and decide what we want to do and then uh, we became a, fr a free nation and uh, here we are after 240 years or so um, and I think uh, the Kurds look up to the United States and uh, Western nations um, in the form of uh, having these uh, success stories that come out of this part of the world um, we value democracy and equality and uh, we hope we can achieve that too I mean we know the struggle is not going to be easy uh, we've been doing so for many hundreds of years, um, but I think these conversations are very important. But I think something that's important to talk about is that we are human beings. Uh, a lot of people demonize uh, different ethnic groups and saying they're different than us, they're not like us. But I think it's very important to understand that we're no different than Americans or Europeans or other ethnic groups. We are the same and we want the same thing. We're one people. We are all one people, exactly. And all we want is to live a free life, one that is prosperous and safe and uh, one where our kids can succeed in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So being Kurdish, um, how do you know when you see another Kurd? Is there um, a look or a, a, a cultural expression that you would recognize? Um, it's, a, it's a bit diff uh, uh, difficult to say, a, you know, you can see a Kurd from a distance, but I think their hospitality is clear. Uh, one thing that I've talked about is it doesn't matter who you are or if you know them or not, but if you walk to a Kurdish household and ask for help, uh, they'll be more than happy to assist you, I welcome you into your house, uh, provide you tea and food. And so that's something that you can definitely see uh, quickly that uh, um, that individual is Kurdish and uh, they, uh, they take pride in it. But I think uh, regarding appearances, uh, you can't tell because we're such a diverse community. Um, there's been so many conquerors and, and invaders in that part of the world where 
just throughout time, you're seeing, you know, a different individual. I mean, for example, you have folks in Kurdistan who have, you know, dark hair, brown eyes, but you also have folks who have blonde hair and blue eyes, um, just because of the um, the interest and the location of, of the Kurds um, that's taking place. But regarding appearance, you can't really tell the the, the difference. But but the language that we speak is Kurdish. Um, we have our own independent language uh, that is different than Persian and Turkish, um, and also different than Farsi. Um, so it's very unique. If you hear someone speaking Kurdish, you can, uh, I guess, from their language, uh, pick out that they're uh, probably from that part of the world. Yeah. Well, you've definitely summarized this before. <laughs> That's really <laughs> succinct. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, of the people you commonly come in contact with in Maine, what percentage of the people do you think really know any of the basics about Kurds and the Kurdish mm. plight? I think... You know, it's hard to give a percentage, but I think it's definitely a smaller percentage that know about the Kurdish people or the struggles of, of the Kurds in Kurdistan in general. Um, but but I think in recent um, developments, let's say the Iraq war or even the co conflicts with ISIS, the Kurds and specifically the, uh, the Peshmerga, the freedom fighters there, um, have really gone, uh, got a lot of uh, popularity, if you will, from the media uh, because they're kind of being the uh, the individuals right in front of of the battlefield defending uh, much of the Kurds and also throughout Iraq. So I think with with recent um, situation taking place with with the wars, we've, we're we're hearing more discussion about the Kurds, especially how they've really supported the United States. They've helped the U.S. troops overseas. I think that's one thing that um, has been talked about much. But generally speaking, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done regarding creating more of a conversation, more awareness about the Kurds and, and what they're fighting for because. Um, it is true that the Kurds in Iraq uh, have seen a lot of success and growth over these uh, last couple of decades, but there are still millions of other Kurds in other parts, as you mentioned, Turkey, Syria, and Iran, that uh, need more work to be done and more awareness. Because for the Kurds, that they're not, you know, their their um, threat is not clear. It changes every day, and they're not just uh, de debating or having conflict with one government. We have to, unfortunately. Uh, be very cautious of our surroundings because we have to be in constant uh, conversation with four governments and uh, the reality is these governments are not doing it in a, in a civil way. This, these uh, discussions haven't been peaceful, unfortunately. Um, instead of dialogue and diplomacy, uh, many of these governments have uh, taken up arms uh, to kill defenseless people uh, simply because we're asking for democracy and equality and uh, they see that as a threat to their uh, status quo that they've created for uh, many years. Yeah, is this uh, a rare awareness raising? What made you want to write a book about finding Kurdistan? Mm. No, absolutely. I think uh, this obviously goes back to 2010, where where this book takes place and uh, the conversations of me going back to my homeland, back in Iranian Kurdistan. But w once I came back home uh, in high school, at the time, uh, I spoke with my classmates, my friends about the things I saw there. And they were very, you know, they were very, uh, you know, interested and fascinated with the the stories I had to tell them. And I think and I thought, how can I spread this word more? The classroom seemed to be engaged, but I want to take that to a bigger level, where it's not just folks that I know or classmates or uh, the school in general. Um, let's bring that to a, a bigger audience. And I think uh, uh, this book hopefully helps with that. Um, uh, it's it, it, this is a book where people can pick up on uh, whether you're a teenager or a young adult or even an adult. Who, who doesn't know much about Iran, the Kurds, Kurdistan, um, and it's written in a way that um, for the, the reader can really uh, pick up on quickly, learn about it, but also understand what's happening today yeah. uh, in that part of the world. It's um, super accessible. I think you've done a great job. You tell it in your high school voice. That's when you went back there. Um, I think what's important and what really comes through in the book is that the Kurds are really second-class citizens. And it, it's caused a lot of strife. And not only are they also Muslim, but they practice different cultural customs. And so it's right. they're identified and and limited in their uh, freedom. And um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think reason. I think it's true because um, to have these conversations, uh, we really need to understand what's taken place in the past. Because the only way we can move forward as a community, whether here in the United States or uh, back home in Iran in the Middle East. Um, we need to understand what's taken place in, in, in our past because that's the only way we can move forward. And regarding the Kurds, um, like I said, we need to appreciate diversity. 
we right right now in the United States we appreciate diversity. We can speak any language we want, and uh, you know we really have that um, that uh, potential opportunity to speak and be involved and do that in whatever religion or uh, you know custom that we want. But back back in Iran, that's not the case. Um, the Kurds have been killed, uh, persecuted, um, threatened uh, for many many years uh, simply for as I mentioned before wanting to be free and equal. That's one thing that's very important to the Kurdish people. But on top of that is uh, dictating our own future, not having any foreign body or a f foreign political force tell us how to live our own life. Yeah, that's really um, important. Which is very interesting uh, and very important uh, conversation to have because um, it's it's to have a different you know, a political power to come tell you what to do is not going to make sense to you. It's a different language, different values. But w when we say we speak Kurdish, we are Kurds, we have our own democratic values, we stand true to that. And we will fight uh, f for that because uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, a successful Kurdistan uh, b belongs to the Kurds. Yes. While living in Maine, your parents, your sisters, your brother and you were separated from your huge extended family, your loving family in Iran, um, due to political conflict. And while you're clear that the six of you became very close while finding your way in this new country, there's so much more to it. In your book, when you travel back to Iran, you express beautifully when you realized the full scope of your losses of the separation. I wondered if you would read that quote from page 78 in your book, Finding Kurdistan, regarding the first week you were in Iran as a 15-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. The night came faster than I wanted to that day. I was having a great time talking to my family and learning more about them. My, my parents' decision to come to America had been full of obvious rewards, liberties, economic opportunities, political stability, etc. Yet it came with pitfalls as well. I felt I had been lost my entire life and I had just then figured out where I belonged. It was sad to think I didn't know most of my family. I think that really um, is such a common theme in in all the interviews I do, these two worlds, these two homes, and this this yearning, neither one being totally complete without the other. Right, that's so poignant. I think it speaks beautifully to the hearts of immigrants everywhere. Mm. It was just, it was very different to go back home and uh, see individuals who were close relatives to you, but you didn't uh, not understand what that was. Um, because I came to the United States when I was about two, three years old. And uh, the U.S. is home to me, right? So I'm kind of stuck right in the middle of, of, you know, let's say U.S. going to Iraq. And it's almost like U.S. policy, but it's also a Kurdish policy there, too, of, like, defending your own people and not allowing a death and destruction to take place from a different political forces. So I was right in, in the middle of that. Um, but it's, I guess, the, the reality of believing in what you, uh, you know, fighting for what you believe in. And my parents decided to come to the United States because um, it was in their best interest at the time. When you have a family and children, you definitely cannot um, provide safety in a war zone. Um, but luckily, the United States is a very safe and uh, prosperous and uh, hospitable country that we accepted as home. But also now that we have this freedom and equality and sense of um, responsibility, I thought it was an obligation of mine to write this book and um, talk about the many atrocities that are taking place overseas, specifically for the Kurds and to... I do my part in spreading awareness and um, because the people back home can't do that. They can't speak and be as open as uh, we are here today. We're not, you know, we're having this free conversation, me and you, and we're not in any uh, threat or fear. But back home, the simple conversation we're ha uh, that we're having here today uh, would be looked upon as a threat to the government and um, a harsh re response would take place. I liked the part of your book where you were um, riding in a taxi and the taxi driver was asking you a whole battery of questions hmm. and one of them was, can you really say something bad about the president <laughs> in the United States? And you said, yeah, we're actually kind of obligated to speak up. Right, right, because the situation there is so different. It's tr truly like going to a, d a different world because the political leaders back in Iran are taking advantage of their own people where you cannot have free discussion, free debates within Iran. Um, any type of conversation, any type of critique of the government is looked at as a threat. And then you're going to be either arrested or killed. Those are really the only two options that the government has made. Instead of listening to their own people, 
we all see it. The people in Iran see that there's a problem taking place overseas. But the government is not allowing these free conversations to take place to fix it. Instead, they're killing their own people, imprisoning them. I mean, every single day you go on the news, uh, there are young activists um, being imprisoned. And we talked earlier about the notion of political prisoners. That does not exist in the United States. We don't have political prisoners. But in Iran and other parts of the Middle East, that is a very, very uh, harsh reality for them. Unfortunately, because of your own political viewpoints, cultural, economic, if it does not go with the status quo with the Iranian government, you will be in prison for that. If you're just joining this conversation, welcome. You're listening to New Mainers Speak. I'm Kate Manahan, and my guest today is Hore Haddadi. When he was 15, he and his family, minus his father, returned to Iran to visit relatives. It was wonderful and horrible all in one trip. I wondered if you might be willing to read a passage from your book, Finding Kurdistan, a Kurdish-Iranian-American journey home, so listeners might hear the insights and the tenderness of a boy's journey into the political reality of his life. Could you just say a little bit about this passage and put it in context? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2010, we went back to Iran, to the Kurdistan region there. Um, and it didn't make a, a bunch of sense why my dad can come back. I mean, we had these conversations of, you know, dad being politically active there. He can go back. If he did, he'd be threatened and killed uh, because the government just wouldn't allow anybody with democratic intentions uh, to return back to Iran, especially when you've been a freedom fighter for 20 years or so. And so this, uh, I'm going to read this passage about um, the harsh reality there and um, what it would be like if my dad was there with us. So this is page 145. How would, it, how would it have felt if my father had been here with me in Iran? It was obvious that as long as the same regime was in power, my father wouldn't be able to return. The, gover the government would kill him as soon as they could. I knew my father didn't just fight a war with Khomeini's regime over nothing. There was meaning behind all my dad's sacrifices. And so this goes back to 1979 where there was a big revolution in Iran. Some refer to the Islamic revolution, some will say the Iranian revolution. But in a, a brief, if I could, if I could just uh, briefly, it, it kind of shifted from a uh, monarchy into this uh, a radicalized uh, government um, where restrictions were almost overnight uh, placed on their own people. Uh, people were very critical of the Shah, and there's a lot of flaws there. Uh, but people were sick of it and said, we want a new government. And so when Khomeini came, this religious figure, uh, people didn't really know exactly what his, his long-term intentions were. On paper and on cassettes, it, it sounded good. People were very optimistic of change, uh, for the most part. Um, and so once he came into power, had that authority, became the supreme leader of Iran, um, Iran changed into an Islamic republic, and that's what it is today, uh, since '79 where every aspect of life is religiously infused, but also not just religiously infused, but it's an extremist a position that the government has taken on it. And so my dad wasn't able to come back with us because obviously we're Muslims, we respect the faith, but Islam does not uh, you know, tell people to kill innocent people, children, men and women. Um, and so my dad fought for democratic values in Iran. Um, as a Kurd, not only are we an ethnic minority, we're a political minority, we're also a religious minority. So we're kind of three minorities there. And so the government saw that as a threat, especially because we are the strongest democratic force in Iran. And this goes back even the before Kurds the, the Kurds are. Mm -hmm. Today, they are not only today, but in the past, we were the strongest democratic force in Iran. We were the main force uh, to fight against a communist regime um, for democracy and equality. Um, and not only f not only for the Kurds, but also for for the Iranian community as a whole, because a successful Iran isn't just for the Kurds. A successful Iran is for all minorities and ethnic groups, whether religious or ethnic, Persians, uh, Baha'i, Baha'is, uh, Shiites, Muslims, uh, Christians, Jews. I mean, Iran is a very diverse country, um, and so this whole push for it was not just for the, the Kurdish movement. It, it came from Kurdistan, but it's for a greater Iran. Uh, greater democratic Iran, I should say. I loved your book so much. I I, I think I um, was most struck by the fact that they knew all about you. Mm -hmm. You were just there visiting family, and you were having a wonderful time connecting. And the first, you know, two thirds of the book is all about all these wonderful connections and realizing who you are and realizing how big your family tree is. And then there was that moment when 
they took you aside mm -hmm. and you found out they had folders with your pictures in them and your father's picture. They knew who you were. They were trying to get you to get tripped up and they were intimidating and um, the book takes a real sharp turn at that point. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like for you to revisit all those um, scary times in writing this book and what was your hope in doing so? Yeah, you know, there was so much that took place that summer. Um, back in Iran and Kurdistan, traveling to the, the different villages and cities, which is unbelievable because my parents talked about uh, what life was back then for them as teenagers growing up in Iran. Um, but to see what they were talking about was just an unbelievable experience. One that I wish my dad could come back with us to see it and show us the stories where he grew up. Yeah, uh, I loved when you arrived back and after a long drive and two long flights and the welcome party for right, you was right. just stunning and, yeah, and yeah. well characterized. Yeah, it's just it's just because we, we like I said it's almost like we came from two different worlds. And we're just we come back in the city and unite and see the experiences that that we've been through because we briefly spoke o over the phone. I mean, it's not the same. Uh viewers know that um to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation over a nice home-cooked meal over tea is not the same as a 10-minute conversation on the phone. It's just not the same, especially when you haven't seen each other for many, many years. Um, so going back then was just unbelievable. I mean, words, there's no amount of words that I could say to fully uh, show the, the beauty and love and hospitality of the people back home. Um, but I think in two parts, right? The people are so nice and loving and caring and generally care about the family and community. But the other harsh reality was that I could not forget it, and it would be a shame to not talk about, uh, which I thought was a huge part of the book, was to talk about the reality back home, especially with the, let's say, the religious and political situation back home. Um, because the unfortunate reality is that they're in intertwined, um, and the government has created such a such an unfortunate situation that uh, their their own people are looked upon as a threat. And so... When I was writing this book, I didn't want it to be all just beauty and just the culture, which is so important. Nor did I want this book to be all about war and crime and politics and religion. I tried to do the best that I could to make it as balanced as I could. Do you know what just strikes me right now is here you have your one foot in two diff very different worlds. Right. And um, as a teenager, you went back there bicultural, bilingual, or probably trilingual, mm. um, and... Um, you were able to talk about the two sides of Iran, which kind of is, I guess it's the same dichotomy, just more dramatic from right. the, Iran to the United States. But um, if people are listening and they're thinking, okay, how do I get my hands on the book? How do you suggest people get their hands on this book? Yeah, I mean, we're all familiar with Amazon, so I think that's uh, the, probably the quickest way to get it. Uh, there's two versions. You can get the paperback if people want that, that copy in hand, or you can get the Kindle version online um but there's also river run bookstore new hampshire based uh, uh local bookstore if you guys want to go there and get it or on the website i believe um those are two convenient ways for folks to to check out this read and uh in public libraries around the area yep i know Wyndham public library has a copy I, I believe the portland public library has a copy too if not i hope they'll get it soon and do you have any s signings or events coming up? Um, we, we've had a, a couple of signings uh, take place in Boston, um, a couple in Portland. I don't have anything at the moment, but if there's anybody listening who would uh, want to set something up, I think that's very important. I said from day one uh, uh, that, that I'm willing to sit down with anybody, anybody who wants to help the Kurdish people, the, the, uh, the greater Iranian community in general, because uh, we need to have these, these conversations. Yeah. We're all on the news now. We see so much that's happening overseas. And I see it as an obligation. Uh, so if there's anybody that wants to help to have any, any type of conversation and, and uh, bring awareness to that, uh, I'm more than happy to participate. Wonderful. You're so open and, and generous with your time, too. What's your long-range dream for the Kurds of the world not currently being given equal rights? And how do you hope to be a part of that vision? Th that's a pretty big question. Um, yeah, like what do you want for the whole world? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess what I would say is that I live in... Uh, a great country, the United States of America. Whatever I can do to help the Kurdish people, help Iran, uh, I, like I said, I see it as an obligation, and, and I will do so at whatever capacity. Um, but all I can do at this moment is talk about it, sit down with my community, you know, write a book, and have these conversations because this is the starting point. We have to talk because 
the, the opposite of, of talking and having civil conversation is, is violence. And nobody wants that. Right. We've, we've, the Middle East has seen plenty of violence. And that hasn't been working. And so I think having these civil conversations, and let's have these serious conversations, not just, you know, political conversations or, you know, conversation for personal greed or interests. Serious conversation for the success of Iran. And, and for and I think if Iran succeeds in treating its own people safe, I think the Middle East will change completely. Mm -hmm. Because a successful democratic Iran changes the whole dynamics of the Middle East. And yeah. so what I would love to see is a democratic Iran, one that values their own people, men and women, political minorities, religious minorities, all types of minorities, be treated the same way. And what is my uh, a, a case in point in the United States of America? I lived here my entire life and I've had a, a great life. Hooray, you are extraordinarily focused on your vision, and you seem to genuinely understand that equality is a human right. You've been given opportunities your cousins did not receive, and you're determined not to squander them. May you enjoy many successes which you can celebrate with your loved ones here and abroad. I know they're all very proud of you, and thank you for being my guest today. Thanks so much. appreciate it. And thank you all for listening. If you would like to hear this complete interview or interviews from previous weeks, please visit newmainerspeak.com. I'm Kate Manahan, closing today's program with a song that Hooray has selected for us. Can you tell us what made you choose this song? Yeah, this is uh, the Kurdish national anthem, Ey Rakhib, and I think it's a very uh, important uh, to any ethnic group, is there our own national identity, our language, our national anthem, our values, and I think this is a threat to a lot of people overseas because uh, we don't have this opportunity to speak our own language, hear our own flag, see our own flag. Um, so I thought this was uh, a, a great oppor opportunity for viewers to listen as well. Thank you. Kurdish National Anthem. <laughs> 